Western Hemisphere, transnational crime, civilian security, democracy, human rights, and global women's issues will come to order. The title of this hearing is Protecting Girls, Global Efforts to End Child Marriage. We'll have two panels testifying today. The first panel will feature the Honorable Catherine Russell, Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State. And I want to welcome back Ambassador Russell. And also from the Department, the Honorable Ann Richard, Assistant Secretary for Population, Refugees, and Migration. The second panel will include Ms. Lakshmi Sundaram, the Executive Director of Girls Not Bridges, a global partnership of more than 600 civil society organizations from over 80 countries, and Dr. Suzanne Petroni, who is the Senior Director for Global Health, Youth, and Development at the International Center for Research on Women. Thank you all for being here today. I would especially like to recognize the diverse array of civil society organizations working tirelessly on this issue, many of whom partnered with my staff and Senator Boxer's staff to make this hearing possible. Child mar uh, marriage rarely receives the attention it deserves, especially given the frequency with which it occurs. There are roughly 250 women 250 million women alive today who were married before the age of 15. And the devastating impact it has on girls and sometimes boys is impossible to overstate. It perpetuates poverty. It has lasting maternal and infant health ramifications, and it often contributes to violence. It's not limited just to distant lands, and even it happens even in our own hemisphere. Child marriage cuts across countries, regions, and cultures. In our own hemisphere, Brazil and Mexico are fourth and ninth, respectively, in the world in terms of absolute numbers for child brides. India ranks first in the world, followed by Bangladesh and Nigeria, according to data from the Council on Foreign Relations. In many countries, child marriage is a systematic problem inextricably linked to other developmental issues, which this committee has focused on. For example, girls' education, which I chaired a hearing on in June. Leaving school early makes girls more vulnerable to child marriage, and marrying young often prevents girls from furthering their education. I hope we can further explore the nexus between education and child marriage during the course of today's discussion. Cultural traditions, poverty, and gender inequality also play a role. Given the manifold contributing factors, there is no single solution. Legislative and legal fixes, while important, will not alone provide the solution. Consider, for example, that a Human Rights Watch report released this month found that one in three girls in Nepal are married before they reach the age of 18, despite the fact the legal, age, the legal age for marriage is 20. But the absence of simple answers must not lull us into complacency. The stakes are too high. In addition to the factors I've just described, there are contexts where insecurity, instability, violence, and war have exacerbated this problem. This reality prompted us to invite Assistant Secretary Richard to contribute to today's hearing. And I'm particularly interested in better understanding how refugee and otherwise displaced communities impact child marriage. Early assessments are cause for alarm. The Syrian crisis has been described as the single biggest humanitarian and refugee crisis of our time. Approximately 7.6 million Syrians are forcibly displayed, including many within Syria. More than 4.8 million have fled to neighboring countries like Jordan, where civil society groups reported growing incidents of child marriage. A May 2013 piece in The Atlantic featured the story of a 14-year-old Syrian refugee, Maya, who had just recently been engaged to a wealthy Lebanese man, age 45. The piece quotes Maya's mother as saying, quote, I am marrying my daughters so they can be safe and we can be secure. Maya herself, understandably inconsolable, laments, and this is her quote, the man I am marrying tells me I am the one who protects you. I am the one who feeds you. You have to do what I say or I will throw you in the street. She says, I'm disgusted by him, but I'm doing this for my family so we can live in security. And she continued by saying, he's right. He is the man who feeds us and protects us. And I would rather be violated by one man than by every man in town. There are many reports of wealthy men from surrounding Gulf countries further exploiting vulnerable refugee populations and essentially out there shopping for child brides, enticing families like Maya's with promises of material security and physical protection. These sobering realities were reflected in the findings of a recent interfaith humanitarian assessment mission led by the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service service, which observed that more underage Syrian girls are being married and at younger ages. Some of these early marriages are entered into for economic reasons. It's one less mouth to feed for families living in dire poverty. <coughs> However, the group issued a report which found that other child marriages are intended to protect the girl from sexual abuse directed towards unattached girls or to provide an alternative to idleness resulting from not being in school. 
In some cases, early marriage is also occurring to assist men in gaining access to countries whose borders are, for the most part, closed to single men. A September 2016 story in a prominent German newspaper found that government officials have reportedly encountered hundreds of married minors among the refugee population. This phenomenon is not limited to Germany. Similar reports have now emerged from Denmark and Norway. According to one news report, at least 61 minors were married when they sought asylum in Norway last year. The youngest was an 11-year-old girl. Child and forced marriage is also being employed as a weapon of war by groups like the Islamic State and Boko Haram. Yazidi girls have reported being captured, separated from their families, and sold into sexual slavery. One victim recounted being taken to a wedding hall with dozens of other girls and women and told by ISIS fighters, forget about your relatives. From now on, you will marry us. You will bear our children. In some contexts, girls who are also religious minorities are especially susceptible to this abuse. This is true in Pakistan, which is the country with the sixth largest number of child marriages in terms of absolute numbers. Civil society organizations, especially those working in the area of religious freedom, note that forced marriage and conversion are prevalent among Christian and Hindu girls, particularly in Punjab and Sindh districts. Similarly, in Egypt, there have been reports for many years of Coptic Christian women and girls of being abducted and forced to marry and convert to Islam. While today's hearing will focus on global dimensions of this issue, a domestic component comes into play when a U.S. citizen, who is a minor, is taken to another country, typically their parents' country of origin, and compelled into a forced marriage. It is my understanding that civil society organizations have for several years now engaged the State Department, particularly the Office of Overseas Citizen Services, to propose ways to improve protections and to support U.S. victims. However, it is unclear to, to what extent the Department has taken action. I hope we can address that today. As a father of four, with two school-age girls, these statistics are particularly sobering as each number represents a girl denied the opportunity to live up to her God-given potential. It represents a bride whose wedding day is not a celebration, but rather a memorial, as she marks what could only be described as the death of her childhood. I look forward to hearing from our administration witnesses about the scope of the U.S. government's work in this arena, about trends, about areas where we're doing things right, and areas where there's room for improvement. I'm also keen to hear from our panel of private witnesses. You have experience in the field, and that will contribute greatly to what can too easily be become an abstract policy discussion. Um, I'd now I'd like to recognize our ranking member and ask if she would like to recognize, or do you want to go first, or have Senator Durbin, who I know. I'm happy to yield to my colleague, because I know he's got things on his agenda. Senator Durbin, I appreciate you taking the time to come here. You've taken a leadership role on this issue for, for many years now. And uh, you're more than welcome, obviously, to stay for the duration of the hearing, but we understand that you may be ne leaving after your remarks, as I know you've got a, a full schedule ahead of you as well. But thank you so much for your work and for being here. Senator Rubio and uh, my friend Senator Boxer uh, and my colleague Senator Gardner, I want to sincerely thank you for this hearing, really. I don't know how often we've had hearings on this subject. We should have many. And the fact that you've taken time from your schedule and made it a priority is very, very important. I was thinking about this on the way over here, and there's something troubling about the title, child marriage. Because when you think about it, marriage, by conventional wisdom, wisdom and human experience, is a consensual agreement. It's a social contract freely entered into. In fact, it's one of the few contracts we entered into that we do publicly. Do you take this person to be your wife? Do you take this person to be your husband? But what we're discussing today is not consensual. It can't be. One of the parties is a child, legally incapable of making a binding legal agreement. And it is not free. It is the product of coercion. We know that. This publication, which I hope you'll get a chance to see, and I was just handed on page 18 from our State Department on the subject, in one photograph, shows the story as clearly as possible. Here in Yemen, two grown men with eight-year-old brides. That's not marriage. What we're discussing is no more marriage than rape is love, or slavery is an employment contract. It's not. I wish we had a better word. We tend to give this a legal definition, a legal status which it doesn't deserve. 
Worldwide, more than 700 million women alive today and more than 150 million men were married as children. Many were girls ma married before the age of 15, some as young as seven years of age. An average 15 million such girls are married annually. We know what happens to these girls. They're more likely to not go to school or drop out, experience domestic violence, face great risks of sexually transmitted disease, and experience complications and even death in childbirth. In fact, pregnancy is consistently among the leading cause of death for girls aged 15 to 19. Now, it's been in decline in recent years, but girls living in developing countries or in poor households are almost twice as likely to marry before age 18. Progress isn't happening fast enough. In 2006, 10 years ago, I introduced the bipartisan International Protecting Girls by Preventing Child Marriage Act, which set out to reduce this harmful practice. I believe, and I think many here agree, child marriage poses a direct threat to investments in education, HIV AIDS prevention, poverty reduction, and most critically, the basic human rights and safety of girls around the world. Seven years later, my bill passed. That's, by Senate standards, a pretty quick response as part of the 2013 Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. It required the Secretary of State to establish and implement a multi-year, multi-sectoral strategy to prevent child marriage, making it a clear policy of the government. I'm told this publication is part of the response. Let me thank Senators Boxer, Cardin, and Isaacson for being original co-sponsors of the legislation and for the support of Senator Lindsey Graham and Pat Leahy for including funding in the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bills. In the years since the legislation passed, our government has made a commitment to ending this practice. Last fall, USAID published its Child Early and Forced Marriage Resource Guide, building off its 2012 vision of action. The annual State Department country reports on human rights now include data on child marriage as it should. These efforts are changing lives. In Ethiopia, USAID-supported community-based programs have helped to educate girls and women on their rights and build skills for becoming peer educators. In FY13 alone, over a thousand early marriages were deferred or canceled just in Ethiopia as a result of this work. In Bangladesh, US aid funded programs have helped promote girl friendly educational environments. But in today's world, girls continue to face the sustained practice of early forced marriage, not just because of the ongoing cycle of poverty, but because as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, humanitarian crises and terrorism. We need to do more. We must continue to focus in areas where this practice is most prevalent. We need to utilize a government-wide approach, and I'm going to do what I can to help. I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman, as well as Senator Boxer, Senator Markey, who is not here at the moment, as well as Senator Gardner. I'm happy that several of you have joined me in co-sponsoring the Bipartisan Education for All Act, uh, which aligns with the goal of reducing child marriage. This measure, incidentally, I commend to your attention. Congresswoman Nita Lowy has been a great champion and partner on this bill. She passed it in the House of Representatives. It's now before your committee. I'm going to make a call to the chairman today and ask him to make this a priority. We don't have much time left this year, but this, I think, can be something that we work on. Education is a key to lifting the lives of girls and thwarting the root of terrorism. I look forward to all the progress we can make together on this issue, and thanks for this hearing. Thank you, Senator, for being here, and uh, the ranking member. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Thank you so much. I know you as a colleague, as a friend for so many years, more than we both care to admit how long our family friendship goes back. And you have a heart, and you've brought it to so many issues, including this one. I want to thank the chairman for this hearing. And before you leave, I just want to say two quick things. First of all, when you look at a world in which there are child soldiers, in which there are child prostitutes, in which there's child marriage, there is something wrong. And, you know, as I wind down my days in the Senate, but not my days in this world, hopefully not, um, people say, what are you most proud of? And you try to come up, there are a lot of things that we do that we really are pleased that we could accomplish. But one of them is the day that I talked to then Chairman uh, John Kerry about setting up a subcommittee that focused on women's issues. Because there was never any committee here, subcommittee, that looked at global women's issues. And he said yes, and our ranking member said yes, and Senator Cocker kept 
the subcommittee intact. This gives us a platform to talk about these things. So before you have to leave, and I know you have to go to the floor, I want to thank you for your leadership on this. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, I really, again, want to thank you for this hearing. Uh, child marriage is more than a human rights concern. Um, it is a violation of an individual's freedom. I think Senator Durbin made an excellent point. Uh, marriage has been an institution uh, that has been celebrated throughout the world, and here we have it being used to exploit and destroy, frankly, a little girl's life and her life forever. Um, you know, it's an epidemic of global magnitude. It, uh, it perpetuates cycles of poverty and violence and inequality, and it affects economies, public health, and security. So making our case, we not only can make it on the level of the cruelty of it, but also the impacts of it on whole economies. Um, the statistics are staggering. Roughly one of every three girls in the developing world is married before the age of 18. That's about 15 million girls a year. That amounts to 41,000 girls every single day. And the consequences are clear for global health. For instance, girls who give birth before the age of 15 are five times more likely to die in childbirth than women in their early 20s. So child marriage is killing, it's killing girls. Let's just say it like it is. Infants born of child brides are 50% more likely to be stillborn or die within the first few weeks of life. Child brides are at a much higher risk of contracting HIV AIDS. And the economic consequences are equally clear. Girls that are forced to marry are more likely to be forced out of school. A single year of primary school can increase a woman's wages later in life up to 20%. And secondary school can increase a woman's future wages by up to 25%. This means that she has a chance to live a life. And child marriage is closely linked with violence and instability in households and at a national level. Girls who marry before 18 are far more likely to experience physical and sexual abuse than their unmarried peers. And they're more likely to believe that a man is justified in abusing his wife than women who marry later. So they're in the situation taking this abuse and just taking it, just taking it. The vast majority of the 25 countries that have the highest rates of child marriage are also classified as fragile states, extremely prone to war or natural disasters. By exacerbating poverty, illiteracy, and poor health, child marriage contributes to a country's insecurity over the long term. So given the breadth of the problem, its severe consequences, it's clear we can and have to do more. And I hope that we can all, Senator Gardner, you and Senator Rubio, myself and others, can speak with um, Senator Corker and Senator Cardin, maybe we can take that bill off the desk and, and get it done before we leave here. Um, but I do want to thank so much all of our witnesses, both from our State Department and also our uh, nonprofits, our witnesses, uh, for adding some light on a very dark subject. Um, what I was going to say is I have a bill on the floor with Senator Inhofe. So I'm going to stay here as long as I possibly can before I get called down to the floor. Uh, but my heart is here, and this is an issue I will continue to work on whether I'm here or I'm not here. And with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you. And uh, so we're going to begin with our first panel, uh, Ambassador Kathy Russell and Assistant Secretary Richard for the State Department. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, Ambassador Russell. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's nice to be back before this committee. Senator Boxer, thank you so much for your continued leadership on this. And Senator Gardner, it's nice to see you as well. Um, every 60 seconds, an average of 27 girls under the age of 18 are married around the world. That means that over the course of this hearing alone, 400 girls will get married someplace in the world. As child brides and likely child mothers, these girls often drop out of school, their economic opportunities are limited, and they have an increased risk, as Senator Boxer just said, of very serious health concerns from violence, 
uh, and sexually transmitted disease, particularly HIV AIDS. This does not bode well for U.S. foreign policy objectives. The United States is working so hard to increase the participation of women across the board, including in the formal workforce, because we know that women's full participation is good for women, it's also good for their families, and it's really important uh, for their countries and the stability of their countries. But child marriage is a major barrier to that participation. It strips girls of their ability to learn and contribute to their societies and their economies. In fact, this issue does the exact opposite of what we'd like to see around the world. Married girls are less likely to send their own children to school and to get them immunized. That means that instead of advancing prosperity, this practice fuels cycles of poverty that we're trying to address. When you consider that child marriage is a reality for more than 700 million women and girls alive today, it's clear this issue matters to policymakers, to development practitioners, and to foreign policy experts alike. In short, if our goal is to promote peace, security, and prosperity in countries around the world by empowering women, then ending child marriage is an absolute imperative. In order for us to tackle this problem, it's important to understand why it happens in the first place. Traditional gender roles, poverty, violence, and insecurity all fuel this practice. And each of these drivers, whether it's economic, cultural, or social, can be made worse by state fragility, conflict, and humanitarian emergencies. As my colleague, Assistant Secretary Richard, will go into this in a little bit more detail, uh, but I'd like to underline the point that the problem of child marriage is often exacerbated by armed conflict and instability. In conflict settings, families may view marriage as a way to keep their daughters safe, as in the example, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you talked about, or to lessen economic distress. And we see that violent actors, including rebel or insurgent groups, can force women and girls into marriage. For terrorist groups like Daesh and Boko Haram, child marriage is a depraved tactic. They use it to terrorize and control entire populations and to recruit new fighters. Reports indicate that Daesh has abducted more than 3,000 women and girls, including those from Iraq's religious community of Yazidis and other minority groups. Girls as young or 12 or 13 have been forced to marry violent extremists or sold to the highest bidder, some, bid sometimes repeatedly, like cattle at an auction. And in Nigeria, more than 200 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram in Chibok are still missing. Which brings us to the question of how we can end this harmful, harmful practice once and for all. The fact is there is no single driver of child marriage, and that means there is no single solution, no silver bullet that can address this issue once and for all. That's why the United States takes a holistic approach to address the range of challenges that influence this issue, from health and safety to education and economic opportunity to the rights of women and girls around the world. The policy foundation of this work is strong. Child marriage is addressed in the three interagency policies uh, that we can talk about today, and that includes the first ever strategy on adolescent girls that Senator Durbin referred to earlier and that we discussed in the pri pre previous hearing. That strategy was made possible by the strong support of civil society and by members of Congress, and we are very proud that other agencies, including USAID, the Peace Corps, Millennium Challenge Corporation, as well as PEPFAR, are an important part of this effort. These agencies are also part of the Let Girls Learn initiative because while there is no simple answer, we do know and we believe strongly that the single most important thing we can do is keep girls in a quality education for as long as possible. Under this initiative, President Obama launched a challenge fund to design new holistic programs for adolescent girls. These programs will be created, funded, tested, and implemented by the USAID and the State Department in partnership with a full spectrum of stakeholders in select focus countries. And again, I'd like to thank members of the committee for their support of this effort. We're starting in Malawi, Tanzania, and the other day the President announced that we would also take this approach in Nepal and Laos. This initiative is an opportunity to bring the full weight of the U.S. government to bear on the issue of adolescent girls and to do it in a way that is smart, comprehensive, and coordinated. But I do want to emphasize that our efforts are also community focused because we will not adequately address this challenge without partnering on the local level with political and tribal leaders, families, and most importantly, the girls themselves. Earlier this year, I met a young filmmaker named Tinbit Daniel from Ethiopia, which is a country with one of the highest rates of child marriage in the world. Tinbit created an animated series that shows strong men in respectful relationships with women. She's using art to combat gender-based violence. 
and she isn't alone. She's part of a growing movement of young people who are rewriting their own story of their generation. They're working so that young men are seen as more than perpetrators of violence and young women are seen as more than victims. That's the kind of future we can create when everyone, girls and boys, men and women, have the freedom, the rights, and the tools they need to reach their full potential. The State Department is committed to making this a reality for girls around the world because we know that when these girls are empowered, their communities are safer, their economies are stronger, and their countries are more likely to reach their full potential. So thank you again very much for your leadership on this issue. It's critical to our, our efforts, and we really very much appreciate it. I look forward to the conversation this morning. Thank you. Secretary Richard. Thank you, Chairman Rubio, Ranking Member Boxer, and other members of the committee for convening this important hearing on the plight of millions of girls around the world who are subjected to early enforced marriage. And I, I just want to say, Senator Rubio, Senator Boxer, Senator Gardner, and also for Senator Durbin, you know, we are very well aware how busy and compressed the Senate schedule is, and it is so heartening for all of us that you are carving out time to talk about this issue just right now. It really uh, just speaks volumes about how much you care, and um, it really is a morale boost for us, so thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Al Russell has outlined the scope of the problem. I want to focus my remarks uh, on early enforced marriage among people who are refugees, internally displaced, or stateless. As you know, my bureau aids refugees and others uprooted by conflicts and crises. Thanks to the U.S. Congress, we are funded to provide assistance around the world in um, hot, hot spots and crisis zones uh, to bring relief to people who, who suffer. And as part of this, we see time and time again how these emergencies exacerbate the threat of early enforced marriage. Uh, not only in the war zones, but unfortunately also in the places where families seek safety and take refuge. Boko Haram and ISIL outraged the world by enslaving girls and forcing them into marriage, but these are not the only places where abuses are being perpetrated. Tragedies also unfold every day around the globe as combatants in conflicts use attacks on women and girls to terrorize, subjugate, and scatter innocent civilians. Families forced to split, flee may splinter. Some lose members through death or separation, including losing adult men who are the traditional heads of households. Families also lose their livelihoods, their dignity, and their legal and social status. Instead of being able to work, they must rely on aid. Many find themselves living in poverty, in the close quarters of slums or tents, feeling adrift, uncertain about their fate, and understandably fearful for their future. Having escaped war, at this point, they ought to be able to breathe a sigh of relief and resume normal life. But life in exile is not normal, and regrettably, it is not always safe. So in the chaotic uh, background to these situations, parents may feel that they must do whatever it takes to safeguard their daughter's reputations and their family's honor. And families may be afraid of what will happen to their young unmarried daughters as they flee and find themselves in these new unfamiliar environments. So early enforced marriage becomes a so-called negative coping strategy. Syrian refugees in Jordan point to worries over safety and sexual harassment as reasons for arranging marriages for their young daughters. Some parents also hope marrying a local man will help them stay in the host country legally. Families marry off daughters because they're running out of money. In some cultures, families see their daughters as a burden when it grows heavier, when there are no opportunities or, um, for further education or work. And that is especially true when the family is struggling to put food on the table. And some families see early enforced marriage as preferable to other alternatives open to girls with no other source of income. For all these reasons, more girls are forced into marriage. After two years in exile in Jordan, the rate of child marriages among Syrian girls there was twice the pre-war Syrian average. Before the war, about 13% of Syrian girls under 18 were married. But by 2013, the share of married girls among refugee families jumped to one in four. And nearly half of those girls married men at least a decade older than they are. Even though parents may think they are shielding their daughters from abuse and sexual assault, early enforced marriage can have the opposite effect. Girls married young, especially those married to much older men, are more likely to suffer physical and emotional abuse and sexual violence than unmarried girls. I'm conscious of the time, so I um, trust you'll put my um, written remarks into the record. And what it goes on to talk about is that it's physically dangerous for girls to become young mothers. 
and it's dangerous for their own bodies and it's not good for the health of their babies. And then this, in a way, is taking the scourge of child marriage and passing it on to another generation. And there's a similar sort of passage to the next generation that happens in terms of legal documentation, statelessness. If a girl is too young to be married, if legally she shouldn't be married, if she's living in an un, un, um, sh certain situation, her baby may not get registered. It may not have a birth certificate. And this can provide problems then for the rest of their lives. And then our testimony goes on to talk about the remedies, how we need to strengthen laws against early enforced marriage, how we have to make it easier to document marriages and births, how the United States is co-sponsoring uh, did co-sponsor at the UN Human Rights Council a resolution on the right to a nationality and particularly a women's equal nationality rights, which is so important um, in terms of helping women around the world. We are also supporting UNHCR's global campaign to end statelessness within the next decade. Uh, Kathy's already mentioned the U.S. global strategy to empower adolescent uh, girls and certainly we're really putting a big focus uh, all year this year on trying to get more girls educated. More kids in school generally, more refugee children in school, and especially mm -hmm. refugee girls. Um, I would love to also draw your attention to the Safe from the Start initiative that was launched around this time of year in 2013. This is the third year now that it has existed, and it's to not just respond to bad things happening to women and girls overseas, but to prevent them from happening in the first place. And this is where U.S. leadership has the potential to really make a big difference. Um, and then I have a couple of examples in here from um, overseas. Next week at the UN General Assembly, we'll be doing a number of things uh, that are very related to this. One is the call to action on protection from gender-based violence and emergencies. We'll, uh, there's an annual meeting that will be held. It'll be chaired by Sweden this year, but in the past it's been chaired by the US and we are very much a uh, partner with the Swedes in doing this. And also the president's um, uh, has, an issue, has, has organized and is, will be holding a leader summit on refugees. A piece of that is to encourage countries that host refugees to allow more children to go to school and to allow more countries to, to permit refugees to work. And both of those are potential solutions um, to this problem of refugees feeling they have no alternative but to marry off their daughters. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me, Secretary Richard, begin by asking kind of a Big picture question, because as you look at the list, right, the top five, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil, and Mexico. I know that in the top ten, nine of the ten are viewed as fragile states, but nonetheless, if you look at this list, let's say the top five, these, they have state entities. When you interact with your counterparts in India or in Mexico or in Brazil or in some of these other countries, at the government-to-government -government level, what is their view generally of this issue? Is it we know we have a problem, but we have so many other problems we have to deal with, or is it more along the lines of this is our culture and our society, this is how things work over here, and, and you guys, uh, you know, can't impose some of your views on us. This is the way we do it in this society. I mean, what is the government I, to government? I think when we talk diplomat to diplomat, there's general agreement that this is not in the best interest of, of girls. The problem is that they are embarrassed that this is happening in their own countries. And also it's happening to people who are not in um, uh, the elites of society. There are people who are poor people or displaced people, as we were to uh, focused on. Um, so what helps is when we raise the issue, because that puts it on the agenda of national security foreign policy concerns that the U.S. cares about. But beyond being embarrassed, is your sense that it's a priority for these governments? Is this something that, all things being equal, they would, is a priority for I them? I suspect or something that what you said about? is correct, that in, for some of these governments, they have such a long list of issues that while this is on the list, it's not at the top. And by our raising it, though, it does certainly push it up the priority list. It gets it much more attention than were we not to raise it. We also are making it a priority by raising it in these international conferences. I know mentioning international conferences probably sounds deadly dull, but what we do is we, at the World Humanitarian Summit, at um, a child protection conference I attended in the UAE, for example, at um, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly meetings next week, we show up at very senior levels and we bring attention to these issues and we engage then with very senior levels of these other governments. And so 
it becomes part of the conversation and we get across how much we care and then we back it up by providing uh, funds to make a difference. So I think the U.S. Is, has a very smart approach on it. Well, so give me, I don't want to pick on any one country in particular, but two of these five countries are in the Western Hemisphere, which is also the overview of this committee. In Mexico and in Brazil, are these, is a marriage between a 14-year-old and a 30-year-old legal under their laws? And, if, and perhaps Ambassador Russell. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to respond to that. Um, I think just in terms of the way we approach it, I, I, we try to put it in a broader conversation, which is to say that almost every country, and I, I've just found in the course of my work that the most successful approach for us is to talk about how it's in their interest to do things that we're encouraging countries to do. They, they're not really so excited when I come in and say, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Sometimes I have to do that. But what I talk about generally is that all countries will be stronger if women are able to participate. It's just a fundamental principle and it's the driving force for our work is why it's a State Department issue because we think these countries, we know they will be more economically secure and we, we believe that they will be more stable. And part of the trick about this is how do women participate when girls are, are falling off in really alarming numbers. And so what we talk about is, look, this is in your interest to figure out a way to try to address these, these issues more more aggressively. And we also put it in the context of the sustainable development goals, where if all of these countries are pushing to develop more fully, how do they do that? Early enforced marriage is a specific target under the goals, under goal five, which is the, the gender goal. And it's because there's a recognition that child marriage, FGM, that these are issues, that these are practices that hold girls back. And if we want them to participate, they need to be able to do that. I guess fully. just to get back to the point I made about the Western Hemisphere, if you have a 45-year-old man married to a 15-year-old in Brazil or in Mexico, I don't know what the, whether that's even legal under their laws, but that person tries to travel to the United States with his 14 or 15-year-old wife, do our laws allow them, to, do we recognize them? when they come in on a visa as a marriage. That's why I'm trying to understand the legal status of it in those countries yeah, because they stand out only because I get the places, I'm not, I'm not minimizing the yeah. tragedy of displaced communities and some of the other countries that are mentioned in this list. But, and I'm not saying there aren't severe poverty issues in both Brazil and in Mexico, but I think it's, it's startling that two of the five countries in the top list here are in our hemisphere and, and they don't have massive, uh, they don't have the same issues we've seen in the Middle East. So either, either these marriages are being recognized by their laws and ultimately when they come to us and say, you know, we want to come into your country as tourists on a visa and I hear with my 14-year-old or 15-year-old wife, how do we, what's our... Yeah. I actually, I don't, I mean, we, we can follow up, and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to yeah. that with consular affairs, how they treat that issue in particular. Our, I know that there is a lot of concern about American citizens going abroad and getting married, and our consular folks are being trained on that and have worked very closely with actually some of the witnesses that you have here today in civil society to think about how we can do a better job making sure that they're looking for that of, of Americans who are going back to their home countries typically and getting married and coming back. But as to whether we, how we would handle that coming in, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but we can get that and get back to you on so it. So one step removed from the border, I can talk about how we are engaging now very productively with Mexico and the UNHCR to make sure that any children coming th up from Central America through Mexico get, uh, are treated humanely, uh, that their cases are quickly analyzed, that Mexico add asylum experts to determine what's going on with these children that they're walking alone through Mexico. You know, are they safe? Are they being trafficked? Have they been abused? Uh, are they in peril? You know, it's because children should not be, so I'm, I can't talk directly to the situation of uh, child marriage among Mexicans, but our piece of this, which is to look at the migration flows through Mexico, we are doing a lot more than we have. And it shows the importance of having a good relationship with Mexico so that we can be encouraging, supporting, uh, prompting through uh, this dialogue that's partly bilateral and partly with UNHCR and other governments. Yeah, my curiosity about Mexico and Brazil is basically whether, I don't know how much of that is due to people that actually are from Mexico and how much of it is due to transitory populations that are coming through and for multiple reasons. I mean, I'm really curious about that aspect of it because it's the part, again, I'm just envisioning a young girl who's now entered the U.S. with her husband and decides this is not a real marriage. I wish I could, I mean, I'm curious, do we help her get out of that situation? Is there an asylum status for someone like that, trapped in a marriage of that nature? 
we can go into depth. I know the ranking member is ready to go, so I wanted her to and get And we'll follow up with you, Senator, on, yes. that, on that question. Thanks. Well, I'm going to follow up with this or suppose it a little differently. Suppose a child came in running away from marriage. this abusive marriage, 15, winds up, either comes from Mexico, Brazil, or any of the countries that allow this. And this is an important question, mm -hmm. following up to my friend's question, which is also important, which is if a, uh, I would assume if a marriage is legal in another country, I would assume we recognize it here. I can't be sure about that. But if the woman ran away from her husband and she comes in, woman, girl, mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. and she winds up in one of these places, um, I say to um, Ambassador Richard, uh, would, would, we, would that be a reason for asylum? I would assume it is. And if it isn't, we ought to do something about it. You know, it. one of the um, rationale, one of the legal reasons to become a refugee, which is part of uh, international uh, conventions, but also very much based, U.S. law is based on this, is, um, you know, that you're fleeing oppression or persecution. And one reason for it is that you is, is called membership in a social group. And so it really is up to asylum judges in the U.S., so I'm getting out of my lane on this. We'll have to talk to DHS about it. But I think a case could be made, that, and so a case is certainly made that a form of gender-based violence is child marriage. And so we can say that uh, girls showing up at the border who have been forced into early marriage have suffered from gender-based violence, and, and that that should be taken into consideration when they make a claim for asylum and would be uh, a rationale for granting them asylum. Well, I would like to see an even stronger statement mm -hmm. because if a girl runs away from a 50-year-old husband, she's 15 or 14 or 16, uh, I agree with you completely. It's gender-based violence. It's a violation of her mm -hmm. being. And um, so could you get back to us with a little bit more specificity on it should be just clear uh, to me, and I, I, I think I speak for everyone on the panel, a child running away from this kind of a marriage. So um, thank you for that. South Asia has the highest prevalence of child marriage out of any region in the world. In Bangladesh, 52% of girls, 52% of girls are married by their 18th birthday and 18% by the age of 15. Uh, in India, 47% of girls are married as children. In Nepal and Afghanistan, more than a third are married before the age of 18. So in September 2014, the Cabinet of Bangladesh approved language in the Draft Child Marriage Restraint Act 2014 to lower the minimum age, to lower the minimum age of marriage. This, this gets to the chairman's point. From 18 to 16, this has gone the wrong direction, 18 to 16 a major step backwards in our efforts to end child marriage. Um, how is the U.S. government working with the government of Bangladesh? What, what have we done, Ambassador? Uh, what actions are we taking? What has been, have we had an official response to that? Uh, I'd like to know your answer. Um, well, thank you, Senator. That, it's been an ongoing discussion with Bangladesh. We had, uh, I've traveled there. I talked to the government when I was there. Um, at, we had a uh, U.S.-Bangladesh dialogue in June where the government reaffirmed that they would not try to reduce the legal age from 18 again. So a, as of right now, we are in a position where they have been very clear. They stated on the record in the course of this dialogue that we held at the State Department. Uh, but I think it's a broader... Did you say they did not do it or they did? They did not. They have said that they okay. will not change the law from 18 to, to 16. There ha this, is, this has been an issue that has been churning. Good. Yeah, so we're good for now, but I will say this. I think it's, it's something that we really have to stay on top of. Right. Our diplomats there um, are, are certainly aware of it. They have a really strong civil society there that's very, very active and very engaged on this issue. I met with them when I was there. Um, so I think for now we're in a good place, but I, I think you're really pointing to an important point, which is the notion that any country would even consider this right. is something that's very disturbing for us. And in that region in particular, we've got to really stay on it as much as we can mm -hmm. because it is the numbers are so huge. And when we see that girls are, are really not doing well and falling out of school in alarming numbers, that's where we're trying to say you've got to keep these girls in school and avoid this problem from mm -hmm. the outset. Well, Ms. Chairman, maybe we could work together and with our committee in a bipartisan way uh, 
write a letter to the ambassador uh, from Bangladesh, have a meeting, and just say, please, you know, this, is, this would not be looked unfavorably. It's a step way backwards. But I have other questions. May I submit them to the record? Thank Absolutely. you very May much. I say, Senator, Senator, your leadership helps, and the more attention on okay, all good. of these issues that you all bring to this, that when you remind ambassadors, when you remind other people who work in the government of the United States that these issues are important, that helps tremendously, yeah. and that these issues are interconnected, and that Bangladesh, they, they will never move into the, into the world they want to be in if they don't take care of their girls and make sure that they get educated and they're not getting married early. And it's a simple reality. And the more they hear that, not just from the gender person, but from leaders in our country, the right. better off we all are. And from so men and women combined. Yes, and I absolutely. think, and from both parties here. Absolutely. Which, it's rare that we can find these sweet spots. We do it once yeah. in a while. We can do it on this one. So maybe the chairman and I, and, and since I'm so appreciative Senator Gardner is here, we can, we can move forward. Um, I will just close my comments and we're gonna to run to the floor with this. Um, Bernard Lewis, who is known as a very uh, conservative historian, has said without equivocation what we've all said here in, in our own words. Uh, and he said this, you know, 20 years ago, that if you look, if you could try to find the one silver bullet that could help us in the world to bring more prosperity. It's the way countries treat their, uh, their girls and women. Uh, because all of that talent, of potential talent and brains and, you know, everything that women bring. I mean, it, I've always argued women are not better, we're equal. Mm -hmm. So to keep us out of the thing, out of these governments and force us into these situations, mm -hmm. it's really a crime against humanity and I think a crime against God. So I am hopeful before I leave, and we have this partnership in the subcommittee, that maybe we can do something with Bangladesh. We can, we can write some letters to the administration about how they treat these children when they either escape a marriage or come with a husband. Uh, I think that's helpful. And anything we can do uh, to help what you're doing. I know it's a lonely deal uh, there because as our chairman said, you know, there's so many issues that are on the agenda for, for America, you know, including getting these countries to turn against terror and getting them to, uh, you know, to, to a place where they can trade and they're so important. But at the same time, I think we all believe this is just as important. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. And again, I thank our witnesses that will come and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and let me just add to that, it's part, uh, look, the, the humanitarian moral aspect of this, I think, is clear for everyone to see. And I think what you're alluding to is the deeper argument that the, the fact that nine out of these ten states that are on this list are unstable is probably the cause of it, but it's also the result of it. Yeah. You're basically saying this is a country where over half your population, unless they come from a wealthy family that can position them for success, is never going to be a part of civil society, is never going to be part of government, is never going to be part of your economy, they're not going to be innovators, they're not going to be producers, and their only hope is to get married to somebody who will take care of them. And it goes deeper into this argument that they are a burden on the family's finances, so let's figure out a way to uh, move our girls as young as possible into the care of someone else. I mean, it's interrelated to the fact that why these countries fail, exactly. both economically and geopolitically. In fact, I don't know of any advanced economy in the world that is successful marginalizing over half of its population. It yeah. just doesn't, the mar it doesn't work. And it's, and it's actually more than half, because even among men in those countries, if they don't come from the right families and with the right education, they too are marginalized. So you add that together, that could be 80% yeah. of your population or more, but certainly over 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, these things are interrelated. I do want to get to Senator Gardner's questions. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Boxer, for your words today. And I think this is the highlights of a challenge. I've, I've got two daughters, a challenge that we have to address, two daughters. One of them is 12, uh, dropped her off at the volleyball game uh, just uh, this past weekend. And to think that um, that not every, everybody is going to, uh, it's just an incredible crisis that we have to address. This, this is uh, just overwhelming uh, when you think about what's happening to so many uh, girls, women around the, the world. Uh, Secretary, or excuse me, Ambassador Russell, I think you note that uh, the 720 million women figure is equivalent to 10 percent of the world's population, 15 million married each year, and your testimony you stated that's just a, a stunning figure. I would like to also receive the information that you provide to Senator Boxer, Chairman Rubio, 
uh, about this gender-based violence issue and the determination, the criteria that's being used perhaps in a refugee status of some kind, uh, knowing whether that's, is that a uniform standard? Is, a, is it across everyone? Do they weigh it the same? Is it just sort of a subjective factor? Is it a contributing factor? I mean, how does this uh, equate? would be very interested in receiving that information as well. Um, you know, I wanted to step back a little bit. Uh, this, the, the testimony talks about programs. It talks about partnerships and where you're working with other nations. Could you maybe give us a, a case study, so to speak, of a nation where from start to finish that had a significant problem, walk through some of the programs that you've worked through, and then state where it is today. And I don't care if it's Secretary Richard or Ambassador Jimmy, Russell, uh, but just give us a study of, of how we've been effective and, and what it was that sort of is a common theme between taking that effectiveness, being able to apply it in other places where we haven't quite had the results. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how what we I, I can't point to a country where we we have where it's been perfect. Right? Right. There is no right. such thing. What we've learned through the course of our work is that the key is to try to address these issues in a comprehensive way. And it sounds sort of intuitively right, and it sounds easy, but it's really difficult. It's very challenging. And where we're doing it now, um, where we've started is in Malawi, which is a very interesting country. It's poor. Uh, we went through a long analysis with USAID to try to figure out where, where was the best place to try this comprehensive approach. Um, so we're starting there. They, they have a lot of work to do. A lot of girls get married early. The country's desperately poor, and they don't have mandatory secondary education. So the challenge is how do, we, how do we help them move forward? And I think it's an important point that the United States is not in a position to fix any of these problems or any of these countries. We really can't do it. What we try to do is find countries, find people in these countries who are working on behalf of women and girls who understand the interconnectedness of the connectedness of this issue and are working to try to address it, and we try to support them. And I think Malawi is going to be a really good example of it's the United States, so it's USAID, PEPFAR, um, State Department. We're working with MCC. We're working with Peace Corps. Now we have USDA working with us. Department of Labor is talking to us about what they do. We're also working with our bilateral partners and with our multilateral partners and saying, okay, this is the scope of the problem, and let's see if we can coordinate and work better. So at the end of the day, you're not, you, you can't really address child marriage in a vacuum. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a, in a circumstance where girls are not valued. That, that's basically the problem. Girls and women are not seen as valuable members of society who should be able to finish school and participate in the economy. They're just not. So how do we try to lift them up, lift up the, the way they're perceived in their society? It takes a lot of effort. We as an international community, this is not just the United States, haven't really been able to do this as effectively in the past as we would like to do. I mean, you can certainly point to developed countries, and I think as, as the chairman said there, you know, women are treated better in those countries generally. We know that if we can lift up women and girls, have them participate fully, they will add to their societies, they will make them better. How do we figure out how to do that? I think this, the most important thing is to try to get them keep them in school, in a quality education, try to protect them from violence, try to move them to the point where they can participate in the economy and participate in the civic life of their country. So, for example, they can run for office. They, you know, the more women leaders we get in these countries, the better. It's, it, it's not something that you can do piecemeal. You, I, I, I believe this strongly. We're testing the proposition. We'll see. Um, but I think it's, I, to me, it's the only thing that really makes sense. It's just we're kind of bending the, um, the, the sort of frame of this a little bit because it's not really the way we've worked in the past. Yeah, thanks. And just going back to the, the first issue that we talked about, do we track the numbers of people who may camp, come into the United States uh, seeking there's some asylum status or refugee status, uh, trying to get away from the situation of a forced marriage? Do we, is, is that something that we track? We, we track asylum seekers in the U.S., that's DHS. But in we, terms of this we, particular? We track the number of refugees arrived, but I don't know if we track the subsets. I think we track gender-based so. violence, people who make gender-based violence claims, and we consider early enforced marriage a form of gender-based violence. Whether that is is, is, is uh, pieced out, I don't know. We can, DHS would know that. But I would like to know the answer, and I'm embarrassed I don't have it for you today, so we'll get that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And my, my final question for the panel, we have a second panel waiting, and you've been generous with your time, both of you have is, and I think you alluded to it a little bit in your answer to Senator Gardner's questions, what is the best thing we are doing right now? If we were to say this is the one place where we really need to be involved in terms of turning this around, and my sense is the programs that create an alternative to child marriage mm -hmm. for 
girls growing up and young women growing up and economically challenged or displaced families, mm -hmm. but what, where, does, where could we best get results uh, that will help us towards this goal of wiping this out in a generation? Sure, sure. You know, what we're doing that I think will get good results is that we're working with strong support at the community level in these countries to change the acceptance of child marriage. And we support programs where there's a lot of talking to young people and talking to men and talking to boys uh, backed up by education for girls. And so that's at the, at the, at very much at the grassroots level. And at this, at this diplomatic level, we are very much, I don't know how to diplomatically say in your face, we are very much pushing and encouraging and making um, these empower, issues around empowerment of women and prevention of gender-based violence, including early enforced marriage, part of our platform of discussions. And we keep coming, we're not doing it once, we keep coming back and doing it over and over and over again. I don't know what diplomats think when they see us coming and our boss, and he's, he's gonna talk about these issues. They probably wanna run and hide, but yet we keep coming back and talking about them. And I just wanted to mention on Bangladesh specifically, we have a very close relationship, working relationship with the Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh on migration issues and on um, because of the Rohingya refugees coming across and because so many poor Bangladeshis leave. And so it's very easy. Next week, I promise, I will raise this issue with him. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for, oh, did you have an answer? I, I was just going to say one, one quick thing, which is I think um, when, when you look broadly at child marriage, what, what we see in these conflict settings is an exacerbated situation. Um, and in a way, it has to be treated somewhat differently, right? You, it's such a crisis, and in any crisis, whatever's happening is already is gonna get worse. We see increased rates of domestic violence. We see increased um, early enforced marriage for different reasons, as, as Ian said. And, and sometimes parents literally will say, look, I'm trying to protect my daughter. I, I don't want her out you know, wandering around. She's, she's vulnerable to other men. So we wanna get her married so that somebody's taking care of her and she's protected. So I think, in a way, these conflict settings bring up a discrete set of issues. From our perspective, just stepping back more broadly, I, I really think the mo if you ask me one thing to do, I think it is to try to keep these girls in school. And if, if we can do that, which is very challenging, and the relationship of why they drop out of school and get married is, is complicated. Sometimes they, get, they drop out of school to get married. Sometimes they're out of school and they get married. Um, but regardless, if we can keep them in a quality education where we can talk to them about you know, your value and make sure their parents understand that they will contribute to their families and their communities if they have the opportunities, I think over time that's how we're gonna address it. Having said that, these numbers are alarming, as you say. And even though we are declining, the numbers of child marriage are declining around the world, when you look at the population coming up, we're, we're gonna barely be treading water unless we get ahead of this. And I think we have got to work with other countries to encourage them to do more, and I think we have gotta do this work that we're trying to do at the State Department, which I am grateful, again, for your support of really trying to ad address these issues that women and girls face in a more comprehensive way. I think at the end of the day, it's the only way we're really gonna solve the problem. But thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you for your work and for your time here today and for your testimony. We're, we're now gonna move to our second panel. And uh, as they're transitioning here, uh, join me in welcoming Ms. Uh, Lakshmi Sundaram, the Executive Director of Girls Not Brides, and Dr. Suzanne Petroni, who is the Senior Director for Global Health youth and development at the International Center for Research on Women. Dr. Petroni, are you ready? Sure. Uh, Chairman Review, Ranking Member Boxer, I, I wish you were here, and uh, esteemed members of the committee, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony on the human rights abuse that is child marriage. My organization, the International Center for Research on Women, has been building the evidence base regarding child marriage for the better part of two decades now, and during that time, we've worked to raise awareness of this important issue across the globe. We've also worked with so many in the U.S. government, including uh, Ambassador Russell and, and Assistant Secretary Richard, 
to expand evidence-based policies and programs to prevent this harmful practice. So I'm so proud to testify before you today along with such committed advocates and thank you uh, for continuing to advance this cause. You've already heard today that we know quite a lot about child marriage, but we're still learning. And so I'd like to speak today on some of the emerging evidence that ICRW is generating on the causes, consequences, and potential solutions to ending the practice. Nearly everywhere where child marriage is prevalent, social and community norms around sexuality and around gender play a tremendous role. Where girls are valued only for their positions as wives and mothers, where viable economic opportunities are available only to men, or even talking to men and boys aside from your brothers or uh, fathers is forbidden, where girls but not boys are taken out of school to help with household chores because girls' education is seen as having no value, child marriage will continue. So gender inequality in itself is a significant driver of child marriage wherever it happens. Now, much of the early evidence that we have on child marriage came from India, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia. These are places where parents or community leaders were and still are in many cases the main decision makers around marriage. Girls in these contexts are often taken out of school and married off by an adult and often to an adult. And in contexts like these, targeting these decision makers and shifting social norms regarding the value of the girl, some of the solutions you've already heard today, are of utmost importance. But we now have more evidence from different contexts, including evidence that, that my organization is releasing today from Kenya and Zambia, where girls are forced to drop out of school not because of marriage, but because the practical costs of attending school outweigh the bleak economic prospects that girls and young women have for their futures. And once they're out of school, girls may be forced to marry, either because it's socially unacceptable to be an out of school unmarried girl, or because marriage may be their only means of financial support. We also know from ICRW's research in Sub-Saharan Africa and from the work of Promundo in Latin America and Tahare Justice Center in the US that many girls are dropping out of school and they are becoming child brides because they become pregnant. And this is seen as something incompatible with formal education in many contexts. So while understanding the different drivers of child marriage is important in helping us identify the most appropriate solutions, our research has shown there are some solutions. And I'm glad after talking about the challenges that we're able to, to think about some solutions. Uh, you, can, you can find more about these solutions in ICRW's report called Solutions to End Child Marriage, but in short, they include empowering girls with information, skills, and support networks, educating and engaging parents and community members, enhancing girls' access to quality formal education, as we've just discussed, providing economic support and incentives to girls and their families, and lastly, encouraging supportive laws and policies in their implementation. And again, interventions that use several of these approaches are most effective. Given our very latest research findings, I would add to these solutions that providing adolescents with education about their bodies and their rights, starting with basic information about fertility and pregnancy, can also be an important solution to curtailing both teen pregnancy and child marriage. Uh, I'd like to close by making a few recommendations for your consideration. First, it cannot be assumed that child marriage will adequately be addressed as part of the increasing and very worthy efforts to advance the broader health, rights, education, and welfare of adolescent girls. We need to ensure that child marriage prevention receives the dedicated attention it deserves. So I recommend the Senate consider commissioning a report by the administration that details where, how, and how much the Second, don't let married girls get lost in the shuffle. There's 15 million girls who marry each year. They are among the needy. Western Hemisphere where child marriage rates are high, but attention to these issues is still low. And finally, continue to support girls' empowerment and rights. 
We cannot overcome this challenge without ensuring that girls have viable alternatives to marriage, that they know their rights and they're equipped to advocate for them. Mr. Chairman, I know of no other government in the world that has articulated as solid a commitment to advancing the rights of adolescent girls as the U.S. has this year. And there's no stronger foundation on which to build truly transformative change. So as we move into a new administration in the coming months, it will be incumbent upon Congress to ensure that we build on this foundation and advance the welfare of girls worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sundaram. Chairman Rubio, Ranking Member Boxer, and esteemed members of the committee, thank you so much for the invitation to provide testimony today. I'm Lakshmi Sundaram, and I'm the Executive Director of Girls Not Brides, the global partnership to end child marriage. We are a global civil society partnership bringing together over 600 organizations working in 80 countries dedicated to ending child marriage. Our members are diverse. They range from tiny community groups to some of the large international NGOs that you will have heard from before. And we're represented here in the United States by our U.S. national partnership, Girls Not Brides USA. And I would urge you to consider their excellent testimony that they've submitted for the record, which contains a comprehensive view of U.S. efforts on this issue to date and recommendations for future action. Now, for those in the room who are married, I want you to think back to your wedding day. Hopefully, it was a day of joy and love and promise, and hopefully it was a day that opened up new horizons and opportunities. For the 15 million girls around the world who are married every year, their wedding day represents a closing down of horizons. As you said, Chairman Rubio, child marriage is not linked to any specific region, tradition, or religion. It happens all over the world. You mentioned Brazil and Mexico as being two of the countries with the greatest number of child brides. Other countries that may, you may find surprising are Indonesia and Nigeria. I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about why it happens. And it's important to remember as we discuss child marriage that the vast majority of parents love their daughters and want to do what's best for them. But most fundamentally, child marriage happens to girls because they are girls, because girls have less value than boys in society, and there's an outsized value that's placed on their virginity. Child marriage is linked to poverty. Parents may feel that giving a daughter in marriage will reduce family expenses, and in some communities, there may even be a financial transaction involved, like a dowry or a bride price. Many parents marry off their daughters young in areas where girls are at high risk of physical and sexual assault, as you heard earlier. Parents see marriage as a way of ensuring their daughters are protected without necessarily thinking about the significant violence that they will encounter within marriage. And why should we tackle child marriage? We should because ensuring girls have the right to choose if, when, and whom to marry can create long-term change for girls themselves, their families, and their countries. But what's more, child marriage is at the heart of many of the challenges we want to overcome as an international community. Think about it. Our efforts to reduce child and maternal mortality will be hindered as long as girls are giving birth as children. Our efforts to ensure every child can finish school are undermined when girls have to leave to get married. Our efforts to end violence against women are held back as long as so many girls are trapped in marriages where they have no voice. As my colleague Dr. Petroni said, we now know what it will take to end child marriage. It will take working with girls themselves to ensure that they know and are able to exercise their rights. It means changing community attitudes that devalue girls and hold them back, including by engaging with parents, boys, Christian, Muslim, Hindu priests, and traditional leaders as well. It means ensuring that we have education, health, and legal services that are available, high quality, and accessible to girls, both through government and civil society. And it also means ensuring that we have a supportive policy and legal framework in place. We've seen some amazing progress over the last few years. For example, in the international arena, ending child marriage was included as a global development priority in the Global Goals for Sustainable Development. And we've seen a number of countries take leadership and strengthen their legal frameworks and develop national action plans to end child marriage. But this is not a problem that we can legislate our way out of. We need far, far more investment in programs as well. 
In this country, as, been, as has been mentioned before, we saw the launch earlier in the year of the U.S. Global Strategy to Empower Adolescent Girls. This strategy enshrines a commitment to girls' rights in U.S. foreign policy and assistance, bringing much-needed attention, and I hope, resources, to the diverse and urgent needs of adolescent girls, including the right to choose if, when, and whom to marry. The U.S. is poised to be a leader in the fight to end child marriage and has already done so much towards this end. But I urge you to escalate this work to improve the lives of adolescent girls globally. So to that end, Chairman Rubio, if I may, I'd like to respectfully make a few recommendations for some initial measures that you could take. First, please use the powers of Congress, of the purse and of oversight, to make sure the global strategy to empower adolescent girls is robustly institutionalized and implemented. Don't let child marriage get lost in larger effort to promote girls' health and education. Mandate regular progress reporting so that Congress and civil society know exactly what is being done to end child marriage and meet the needs of married girls, how successful these efforts have been, and where more investment is needed. And show your full support for this issue on the international stage by investing fully in achieving the target to end child marriage under the Sustainable Development Goals. Chairman Rubio, one of the most motivating things for me in my work is hearing the stories of girls who've actually been able to avoid marriage and are now fulfilling their potential and doing amazing things around the world. I do hope that you'll join us in creating that positive world for girls all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. It's, uh, it's why we're here today, to try to figure out the way forward, both in our existing programs. I mean, the purpose of these hearings are threefold. One, to call attention to the fact that this is happening. It gets lost in the broader stories about everything else that's going on in the world. The second is to look at what we're doing and make sure it's sufficient in terms of dollars. And the third is that there are actually programs that work. So let me, let me start out with the first part. This question is for both of you. Part of the issue here in both your testimony and what I've heard here today as well is the decision makers in these cases are not the girls. The decision makers are often either their families and or community or religious leaders. Number one, I mean, how do you influence what programs, how, what is a realistic and positive way to influence better decision making by families and religious leaders? And are there examples of programs that have been successful at doing that anywhere in the world? Either Anyone can go first. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I said, I mean, based on, on the evidence that we've seen in many contexts, uh, absolutely right, it's the parents, it's, it's uh, religious leaders and community leaders who are driving that decision um, in the context where girls are not valued. There are some excellent examples out there where educating and rallying and engaging these adults uh, have been successful once they understand the harms that child marriage can pose to the girl herself as well as to their family and their community in terms of health outcomes, educational outcomes, economic outcomes. Um, they can be very powerfully engaged in ending that practice. So there are very good examples from uh, Senegal, from India, where adults are leading the charge, religious leaders are leading the charge, parents are leading the charge for girls' education against child marriage um, that we can certainly emulate and, and expand. But are those programs that happen internally that they took upon themselves, or did someone help prod them, move them? I think there's a combination of factors. I mean, there are some, um, some parents, fathers of daughters like yourself, who recognize that their daughters have value beyond just being a wife and a mother. Their daughters should be educated. Their daughters should be engaged in communities. Look at Malala as a terrific example. Her father uh, was and still is a tremendous leader in, in ensuring that she was able to continue her education. At the same time, programs, including those supported by the U.S., have been very helpful in identifying uh, for community leaders some of the challenges that can be faced if girls marry and helping parents to understand that there are alternatives. So I think we've seen a combination of efforts, and we certainly haven't seen enough at scale to make the type of change that we need to. And if I, if I could just add um, quickly to that, when we look at, uh, at the membership of Girls Not Brides, a number of the organizations who we work with were set up either by um, child bride, former child brides or 
people who saw maybe their sister get married, who are from the communities, and who work directly with some of the decision makers to help to help create that understanding of the negative impact. One of the things that's, um, that actually led to the, the creation of Girls Not Brides was that many of these efforts were taking place in isolation. And we've been trying through our work to create a platform where people can learn from one another because the types of, of discussions that you need to foster um, are the same, whether it's in rural Pakistan or rural Cameroon or in Brazil, and actually finding a way to share what works um, how it needs to be done, how it can be scaled up, is incredibly important. Can I just ask, is this largely a rural phenomenon, or do you find it even in large urban areas? It's, I mean, you, in terms of around the world, you see it everywhere where there's these characteristics? Uh, it really depends on the, on the country. The country. It, it, uh, it definitely happens a lot in the rural areas, but it can also be seen very much as a coping mechanism in urban settings, particularly in areas where there's uh, a high risk of, of violence to girls. The, the second question I have for both of you is along the lines of what I asked earlier, and that is at the government end. We interact with a lot of these governments, and in many cases, not just governments, it's regional or local governments who have even more influence than some of the national governments might have on an issue like this. I imagine, in my, my view, or from what I've read, they come in three strains, and there are governments that actually think this is a priority and want to do something about it. There are governments who say this is a priority, but either it's not a priority for them in terms of action, and then there are those governments who, quite frankly, have accepted this as part of who they are, and, and even if some of them might be embarrassed by it, it's just not something they have time or interest in, and maybe even are culturally think this is fine. Um, so uh, is that an accurate characterization of the governments we're interacting with to the extent we're talking about places that have governments? In some cases, there might be some ungoverned spaces. Um, but, but, but is this the experience we've had with, depending on the country, a lot of it, you get varying degrees of cooperation and or hostility from, from governments? Sure. Yes. Um, and, and actually, our, our members in a number of countries have, have come together to form national partnerships, just like there's Girls Not Brides USA, there's Girls Not Brides Nepal or Girls Not Brides um, Zambia and in other countries. But one thing that um, our members find a lot is that when they work with government and when they have a, a progressive government that's actually interested in addressing this issue, there's, there's a lot of openness to, to creating a national strategy, a national action plan, but often these governments take the case of Nepal that's, uh, that's developed a na national um, action plan on child marriage. They don't have the resources to, to actually really implement that plan in any deep way because they've been facing so many other problems as well. So even in governments where there's, there's a, a huge will, they need increased support from foreign friends, um, and this is where I think the United States could, could really um, play an, an incredibly important role. In some other countries, I think having the, the United, uh, United States ask about what is going on um, within the, their country and how, how they are addressing child marriage is, is something that could also be incredibly helpful because it highlights that talking about child marriage, talking about issues affecting girls is not just some like nice to have thing in the ghetto of the women's ministry, but is actually an issue that is um, of great interest to a uh, foreign policy behemoth like the United States. And I, I can add, I, you heard from Ambassador um, Russell and Assistant Secretary Richard about the same point, that when they do raise in diplomatic discussions this issue with governments, it helps to uh, draw their attention to it. We also have the State Department Human Rights Reports, which now report on child marriage in each country, and that raises the level of, of diplomatic engagement and attention by governments to, to this issue. Um, one of the things that, that we're trying to do to get some of those governments that aren't yet on board with this is to help them understand the e economic impacts of child marriage. So ICRW is working in collaboration with the World Bank to do a rigorous assessment of the economic costs of the practice with the idea that we know the health-related costs, we know the human rights challenges, we know the education uh, outcomes for child brides. That gets us only so far, unfortunately, with some of those governments that aren't as attuned to the issue. If we can share with them the economic impacts that the high prevalence of child marriage has 
not only at the level of the girl and the household, but on up to the national level. And if we can help them understand that ending child marriage will save them literally billions and billions of dollars, that may help increase some of those finances that are needed to implement uh, programs to end the practice. Well, let me, I, for, when I heard that and I didn't have a chance to follow up, it's, I, I understand how interacting with a diplomat from one of these countries, the diplomat might be embarrassed and say, yeah, this is bad, because these diplomats travel the world or worldly and, and probably high, highly educated and exposed uh, to the West and beyond the world. My concern is more of those countries where at the regional or local level, there really just isn't a commitment and, in fact, quite frankly, an acceptance and or perhaps even participation in the case of some of these government officials in some of this. And, and that's the point I'm trying to drive. There are governments in the world who, at least at the place in which policy is truly driven and implemented, not discussed at an international forum, but actually driven on the ground by the local police department, the local municipal authority, and beyond, this is not only not an issue, but in fact, to them, this is none of our business, and this is the way things have been, and this is the way things are, and, uh, and so forth. Is, is that a fact? There are places where at the regional, local, and perhaps even fed national level, the policymakers who are implementing these things don't view it, would look at this conversation here today and strongly disagree. Am I accurate in stating that? And, and, and if so, are you comfortable telling us who some of these places are? But that's, that's why just putting in place laws is not enough. It's not just a legislative fix. And, um, in a number of, of places, there's been increasing amounts of work on, on working with a wide variety of actors. So parliamentarians, for instance, are, are getting together to, to really try and see what they can do to, to change the, the practice. Um, but it's also like working on, on educating police departments and local and regional decision makers so that they also see their role within addressing the challenge. It cannot, as you say, just be at the, the national level. That interest in tackling the issue is something that has to, to come down. And that's where it's, it's really important to have that combination of local and national civil society pushing um, the decision makers because it, to, to really show that this is not a, this is not a concern that's coming from the outside, that's coming from the West, but that is really coming from the, the people who are most affected by it with the enabling environment and the support that's coming from external countries. And we are seeing change in a number of countries where, um, you know, five years ago, it was completely taboo to talk about child marriage in, in any sort of national, regional, international context. Uh, na last year, there was at the African Union um, a big summit of heads of state. Uh, there, some of the countries have, have been vying with one another to see, you know, it's almost like a little competition of who can, uh, who can actually put in place a national strategy, who's making commitments to address child marriage, and it's, it's not enough. There's still a huge amount to be done, but even starting to, to get that change of mindset in the, the heads of government is something that, that is a really good step in the right direction. Just my, my view, I know of and have seen cases of local uh, governments and regional governments in part of the world that will not investigate rape charges. Mm -hmm. They just won't do it. They'll ignore it. They laugh about it. Uh, they sometimes insinuate that it's not a big deal or perhaps it wasn't rape at all. Uh, if that's how they feel, can you imagine, I mean, if, if that's how they feel about that, getting them to prioritize and actually do something about child marriage at that level of government, I would imagine is a heavy lift. And, and I'm not arguing that we shouldn't try or do something about it, but ultimately it goes back to the argument you've made and that these programs are important. We want to make sure which are the ones that work, but there's got to be a change in government culture in these places and leadership culture to actually view this as something that's wrong, not just as the way things have been done for a thousand years and that's how we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. You're absolutely right on that point. It, this is a challenge, I think Ambassador Russell um, said it, there is no one single solution to this challenge. We have to tackle it at, at different levels and in different ways. Certainly getting the, the engagement at the national level is critical and we are doing that increasingly and seeing some amazing examples out there. I think you mentioned Nepal and, and Zambia, those are two tremendous leaders at the national level and they're using that leadership to then work down through the regional and, and community levels. But at the same time, that engagement from the community on up is critical. So this is where 
the diplomacy and development connection is, is really important. We need the State Department to continue engaging at that high level, and we need USAID and other programs, the Peace Corps uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, to work at the community level and to support those local organizations and local leaders who are willing to make change um, in various ways. Which brings me to my last point, and I hope that we can end on a high note here, and that is one of the best ways, I think, to achieve these goals as you've argued, is to convince leaders that this is not just the right thing to do, it's actually good for your country. And so we would want to point to examples of places that have made these changes and as a result can point to economic progress, a more stable society, uh, better governance, all the things that are good for everyone. And um, so I think you just mentioned one or two, but could you just, let's just reiterate for the record, the one or two countries or more hopefully that are great examples in terms of the steps they've taken and the trajectory that they're on in, in terms of addressing this and perhaps even eliminating child marriage in, in, their, in the context they're facing. Where's the good news? There's, there's good news in, in a number of places, but you know, we are still very much at the early stage of, of this work. So, um, so in countries like, uh, as we said, Nepal and Zambia, there's been a huge amount of work that's already started. We're seeing change in, in the lives of individual girls, but, but we still need that, that great expansion of work to see a nationwide change. Um, in places like Ethiopia, we've seen programs that have been taken from addressing the needs of a few hundred girls to now addressing the needs of a few thousand girls. That's incredibly important and that's had a huge impact, but it's still not enough to meet the scale of the problem. So until we, until we actually are able to, to massively scale up the work that's, um, that's going on at the, and that's showing promise, it's going to take a really long time to, to get to that answer of which country has been able to eliminate child marriage because we know we know it can be done, and we've seen it happen in, in small pockets, but for it to, to happen at that nationwide scale, we really need that, that massive increase in investment, in political support, and in policies. I uh, completely agree with, with Lakshmi. Um, I would just add, this, this is a challenge that can be overcome, but it will take some time. Uh, we like to say, and Girls Now Brides um, has this phrase that child marriage can be overcome within a generation it will likely take that long. This is a practice that is deeply entrenched. It has existed for centuries, for millennia, and we have seen some tremendous examples of positive change. Nepal, Zambia, Ethiopia, Malawi, the latest figures are looking very promising. The more investment, the more attention, the more focused attention on advancing the rights of girls that we have in these countries, the multi-layered approaches that we implement, and the diplomacy, the continued discussions can help us overcome this challenge. Well, I want to thank both of you for being a part of that, for your testimony, both oral and in writing, for your time and for your work and advocacy on this. And, um, and uh, so the record on this hearing is going to remain open for 48 hours. And by the way, without objection, I want to submit to, for the record testimony provided by several other non-governmental organizations who are working on this issue. And again, I want to thank both of you for being involved. Uh, you may, there might be some questions from members, uh, even those who didn't attend, uh, to the extent possible, I ask that you get those, because these all become part of the record that could ultimately be in the future part of justifying or supporting legislation and or uh, uh, correspondence on behalf of the Senate on this issue. And I hope we'll be able to revisit this again in a few months as we get into the funding cycles once again and, and, and really hope to incentivize uh, resources towards not just spending, so we can say we spent money on a line item called preventing child uh, marriage, but in fact on programs that are functioning and working that we can prove results because it allows us to replicate that in other places and quite frankly convince our colleagues to continue to prioritize it. So again, I thank you both for being a part of this and, and with that, this meeting, is, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>